So after uh, Esther approaches the king, uh, she um, has this conversation with him in verses uh, 3 uh, through 5a. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. Now, the first thing he says is, whatever you want, up to half the kingdom. Well, that's a lot, right? It was a it was a uh, ancient idiom. He isn't really offering her half of the kingdom. It's kind of like if I said, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. I'm not actually going to eat a horse, right? I'm, it's just a way of saying I'm really hungry. Uh, and so it was this ancient royal idiom that just meant that the king was ready to be generous uh, in, in meeting whatever request the person had. In other words, he's predisposed to look favorably upon the request. Uh, this is showing Esther's political skill. This entire uh, conversation that we, we've read part of and we'll read the rest of is really very brilliant. It's, it's really... Uh, very skillful. She doesn't pounce. He, he, he says, "What are you? You know, what are you here for?" Basically, and she doesn't say, "Haman's trying to kill my people." Right? She doesn't just pounce and and get upset and and emotional. Um. Uh, so she's she's being she's she's holding back uh, a little bit. And apparently, it's always been true that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Uh, and, and, and we know that Xerxes is always up for a party. So uh, this is really a brilliant political move. Do you think he was fat? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. He was tall. He was the he tallest was. of the Persian kings. So okay. We know that much. So I don't know. How he, tall was tall? So they said he was the handsomest too, but I'm pretty sure that by the handsomest yeah. of the Persian kings wasn't really all that handsome. I don't know. How I tall was, how tall was he tall? Yeah, and that's interesting too because people were generally shorter. So I don't think it wasn't like I don't think it was like six eight. I think six feet tall probably was. Considered tall. Yeah, that would have been the six six foot would probably been tall. Then like around like six. Yeah, and he was had taller than anyone else. Yeah. Now you know, don't go by Goliath because that he was really tall, but. Um, so, so, okay, let's keep going. Um, so, in a in a brilliant political move. Esther is both asking the king to do something she knows he will want to do, come, come to a party, right? And she has the two most important men in the kingdom, in the empire, responding to her initiative, responding to her request. That's brilliant. So they go to the banquet, and this is what it says. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, go figure, the king again asked Esther, Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom that will be granted. Now listen carefully here. Esther replied, my, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Interesting. While they were drinking, smart move, Esther uh, requests that they come back the next day for another banquet. But check this out. To what is the king agreeing? Whatever she asks, right? Has she told him what she's going to ask? No. 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 So he again asks for her request and implies a favorable response. But Esther essentially says, if you are willing to grant my request, come back tomorrow for another feast, and I'll let you know what you just agreed to. Like I said, brilliant. Now, why the delay tactic? Why not just go there and say, you know, hey, this dude right here, he's trying to kill my people. Um, it doesn't read like she's afraid. It doesn't read like she lost her nerve uh, once she got there. 
Um, she's not, I don't think she's the shy cucumber of, you know, the VeggieTales um, movie. Uh, she's not a cucumber. I she's don't think so. She's tall. She, is she, she a zucchini? Yeah, that's oh, right. That's right. right. She's, she's a green bear. Uh, that's green bear. That's more like an asparagus. She's a beautiful asparagus, though. Yeah. Um, and also very tasty. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't It doesn't read like she's afraid or she's lost her nerve. It seems more like she wants to obtain his commitment before he even knew what he was agreeing to. Up here. Up here. Up here. Cool. Thank you. Um, so it seems like more like she wanted to obtain his agreement before he even knew what he was agreeing to. Um, and this isn't the first time, right, that Xerxes agreed to something without knowing the details. I think, I think Nestor knew the king and his idiosyncrasies quite well. He's reeling him in like an expert fisherman. I am not a good fisherwoman. Uh, this is the only part I can do. That's it. I ain't touching no fish. I ain't touching no worm. I'm not doing any of that. But speaking of fishing always reminds me of camp. Are you going to camp with me? Anyone going to go to camp with me? You can fish. You can have kids fish. And, and these kids are, have never been fishing, so they're not very good fisher people. And they're young. They're 7 to 11 years old. So uh, they're not the most patient ones. But the, the queen of all queen uh, of all queens of um, interesting fishing tactics was Alicia. Alicia was um, uh, um, her dysfunction was so most of the kids, most of the time, you could forget they come from a hard place. Alicia never was like a And so um, that was true on the dock as well. And um, so she would go and she would, like, she would just have no, she's a little uncoordinated. Uh, that's an understatement. And, uh, and she didn't have, like, the patience to wait for the fish. So this is, this is what Alicia looked like fishing. Oh, no. oh yeah. And they're just constant, you know. And and the guys on the dock are all like, <laughs> you know, dodging the, the, the uh, worm going by on the hook. Uh, that's not how Esther is fishing here. She's got a big one on the line and she's gonna reel him in. Um so Haman is very proud of what's just transpired. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, drunk. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed, no, nor showed fear in his presence, he didn't bow. He was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. So Haman is filled with rage. He had been so happy and then bam. He is uh, angry. It didn't take much to ruin his day. But he decides to boast about it to his family. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had been elevated above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. The suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. So, first let's talk about a gallows, because when we think of a gallows, we think of a noose, we think of, of hanging. 
That was not uh, what a gallows meant in ancient times. Um, a gallows was a structure um, that had spikes sticking out of it, almost like a huge fence. I see we're nodding heads, so I think maybe you, you know this already. But um, and, and the person was killed first, usually by beheading, especially in the Middle East, but but by whatever method, beheaded or or whatever. And then their body was impaled on one of those spikes, and it would be in a place, a public place, where people could see it. And, and part of the reasoning for that was to shame not only the person, but the family. In Eastern and Near Eastern cultures, they are shame cultures. And the worst possible thing you could do, uh, I remember in Korea, they called it losing face. The worst possible thing you could do was to bring shame on yourself and your family. It's why crucifixions took place, place on uh, busy roadways where lots of people would walk by. And see it, and 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 shame would fall on the person, and on the person's family. So his friends say, "Build a seventy-five foot gallows, kill him, and impale him on that." Um, as many as with many small men before and since, Haman tries to make himself look bigger by boasting about himself. But again, he complains about Mordecai. And so Zeresh, his wife, makes a suggestion. Build a gallows for Mordecai, 70 feet high. Haman loves the idea. Go figure. Um, jo Karen Job says, not realizing that its size is the measure of his own pride. I can almost hear Haman's evil laugh. But in reality, God will get the last. So uh, I'm going to wrap this up with a little bit of application. The, 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 the best known phrase from Esther is, for such a time as this. You know, we know the end of this story. So we say, of course she was placed there for such a time as this. Think about this. Esther didn't know the end of the story. Neither did Mordecai. Esther had no guarantee for her safety. She may have known that God guaranteed the ultimate safety of his people. They would not be destroyed. But as she, appeared, as she prepared to approach the king, Esther had no idea if she'd live or die. That takes great courage. This is true for us, too. We don't know the end of the story in this life. We know that ultimately and eternally we will be safe. But when calamity strikes or when we face a difficult situation or decision or we, um, or we have trials that are difficult or hard, we have no idea how it will end for us. Here's my question. Where do we turn when we face times of trouble? Do we tear our hearts? Do we rend our hearts instead of our garments and turn to God and his word? Or do we have an alternate plan? Do we go to another place? Friends, family, entertainment through confession when I'm really down when things are bad I call my sisters what an indictment of my faith Ian DeGood says that when we react to our crises this way we are acting as though we are virtual This world is not a safe place. And we have an enemy of our souls who cannot touch us eternally and not touch our eternal inheritance. 
but he would love nothing more than to entice us to live as virtual atheists that turn to something else rather than turning to God in our times of time. The prophet Joel tells us where to turn in our times of time. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, till tear your heart, and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. I remember this passage being so meaningful to me during those years that Josh was far from. I don't think Josh knows about class. Please don't tell him. Um, this, was, this was so comforting to me. There's also a passage in Isaiah that says, I will, I will, um, I will save your sons. And, and I remember praying this and saying, God, please return a blessing. Don't bring calamity. And God answered that. Not only did Josh come back to Jesus on that trip to Zambia, not only did he uh, get married and worked at Boys Town for a time and then is now a, a Douglas County deputy sheriff, but on Wednesday of next week, we will celebrate my granddaughter's what a blessing. And God could have brought calamity into his life. He chose not to. Because Josh tore his heart and, and not his garments. When difficulty or trouble strikes our lives, our homes, our country, there's only one safe place to go on our knees before God. In the 1980s, there was a, uh, there was a, a, a song of, by, a, by a rock group called Tetra, and the title was, Get on Your Knees and Fight Like a Man. The only safe place to go. The world is not a safe place, and our enemies are real. But our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. May we tear our hearts and not our hearts. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that, thank you that a, a story thousands of years old can uh, teach us, can move us, and we can see ourselves um, in parts of this. Thank you for that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I have questions for you. Um, I'm going to hand those out. Uh, you do not